them, give them the bold truth. Tell them the bold word. It's spiritual warfare. Yeah, it is. That's what it is. My name's Eric Samborski. And we're here to talk to you about the gospel. I think every one of us knows things are messed up right now. And I'd ask the question, are you tired of tyranny, corruption, and injustice? It doesn't matter where you find it. There's a whole lot of places that we can find it. But are you tired of seeing that happen, whether it's in government, whether it's in business, doesn't matter where it is. Are you tired of seeing that? You know, a lot of people, because of all this, causes are raising up all over the place and joining ourselves to a cause, raising our voices up, and I get it. But I'm asking you to be a part of the most worthy cause of resistance in this day. God's resistance. You know, God's looking on everything that's going on right now and He's not too pleased with it. Sin is a mess. And sin has caused all the troubles that you and I are looking at right now inside of our country. It's not just been right now, but it's been going on for years. A mess. And God, He looks down on this and He's got an answer for it. And I'm asking, are you listening to God? Because you may not be able to change people. I may not be able to change somebody that's in a high position in, in government, whether it's local, state, federal. I may never get an opportunity to talk to anybody like that. But you know, a great person once said, Jesus, he said, why do we try and take a speck out of someone else's eye when we got a giant beam inside of our own? So though I may not be able to go sit down with people in high places and try and convince them to do something different, God says, you can do something about yourself. I just want to give you a bit of my testimony. I grew up, I guess, in a home where I was taught some morals. Don't do this. This is the right thing. Do that. And I went to church when I was younger, just kind of like, you know, my parents said, this is the right thing to do. You should go to church. So I'd go to church. I'd hear the people say whatever they said. And then I'd watch people live an entirely different way from what they said was the biblical way. So when I was like 15 or 16, I said, you know what? I'm done with this. I can, I can live like these people are living outside of the church. Why do I need to even go to church? So I left. I got into drugs. I got into hardcore music. I was going, I went to school for recording engineering in Arizona. I lived in uh, Brooklyn, worked in Manhattan doing live sound for a place called Spotlight Live where they had movie premieres. Different uh, artists came there, MTV, NBC, ABC executives and all that. And I thought, I'll just pass my card out. If I can pass my card out, then I can get into a place and I can start working in something that I really like. Well, when I was there, God was trying to get a hold of me. Everything's falling apart. And I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't sleep at night because I thought if I close my eyes, I may never wake up again. And I could, people would tell me, oh, well, you're, you're a good person. You haven't done everything super bad. So yeah, that's going to be fine with you. But you know what? It doesn't matter what anybody told me. Because when I went to bed, I knew that if I was to die right then, I was headed towards fiery hell. I knew that and I couldn't sleep because of it. And that happened for months, myself being in that state where I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know if I should go hang out with my friends or if I should stay inside of my house. I didn't know what was going on. I was still working at this place there in Manhattan. Well, God started to get a hold of me more and more and more. A lot of things taking place where one day when I was in New York City, I walked into Central Park and I said, God, I don't know what's going on. But something's got to change. Something different's got to happen right now. And I need help. And right then, I had been leeching off someone else's internet, a neighbor nearby, I hadn't worked for months. The internet turned back on long enough for me to find out when the next train was coming so I could get out. 
And I found my train ticket and I got out and I went back home and I said, I don't even know what I'm doing. What am I supposed to be doing here? I didn't want to go back home and yet I did at the same time because I didn't know where else to be. Well, I went back home and I said, Lord, I need different people in my life. If I'm going to, if, if something's going to change, I need different people in my life. Otherwise, I'm going right back down the same road that I'm trying to escape from right now. And I had a guy that I worked with in a gas station probably five, six years before that. He came up to me and he said, I'm sorry I called myself a Christian and I did things that a Christian man shouldn't do. But I want to invite you to come to a church that I go to. And I said, sure. So I went to this church. I met the pastor. He shook my hand and he said, it's so glad to, go, so glad to meet you. And I could see something in that man's eyes that I hadn't seen in anybody else's eyes before. The thought that was in my heart was, that guy knows who God is and I don't. And so I sat there and listened and he preached. And I was so convicted, I thought, whatever's going on here, I know that this guy's got the answer and I don't have the answer and I need some serious help. And I asked him what was going on and he said, it's the sin in your life. You need to agree with God's verdict on your soul. God sees you as a guilty sinner and he wants you to agree with him. If you agree with him, you're going to get farther along. So I said, Lord, show me my own heart. Bring, bring back to my mind whatever I've done. I'll, I'm done with it. I don't want to go back. There's other times where I wanted to try and stop living the way I was living. But it didn't stick. But this time I was ready and I was done. I didn't want to keep going that way. So I said, Lord, show me my heart. And he showed me all the sins that I had done. Even some I remember from when I was a little kid. And then going on and up and I just started confessing them all out and saying, that is right. That is what I've done, Lord. I am that person. I did do this. I need your help. Please forgive me. I said those kind of things over and over and over, confessing them out before God. After probably about a couple hours, they had a four-year-old daughter. I was praying on a kitchen floor. These people had a four-year-old daughter. She came down. She put her hand on my back. And then she started praying for me, which just made me lose it. Because I had never experienced anything like this before. But this girl is saying, God cast the demons out of this man. And I thought, what is going on here? But I just kept praying. Soon enough, I knew that God had forgiven me of my sins and changed my life. I knew right then, I was so happy, I didn't even know what to do with myself. I stood up and then I'm looking over and my friends that invited me over to their house to pray, they're on the ground crying and weeping. And I thought, well, I guess I shouldn't be standing up right now. Maybe I should go back down and pray. So I started praying some more, but I, I realized that all that weight, that burden of, of, of guilt of sin that was on my conscience was gone right then. Then I remembered when I, the days going after, I, probably about two weeks later, I remembered that I wasn't smoking, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't doing drugs anymore, and I had never specifically asked God to help me stop that. But I remember just reducing the tears because I thought, I've tried to stop this, I don't know how many times before, and it's never worked. But now, something changed in on the inside. And that's why I'm here talking to you, not as somebody that's better than anyone else. But I'm just telling you, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on in your life or what's going on in your heart. But there is a judge of all the earth that is looking down on every single one of us and he knows the most intimate details of our life. He knows our thoughts. He knows what we've done. He knows what we're about to do. He knows all of that. And I said in the beginning that if we wanted to join a worthy cause, we should join the most important resistance cause here on this side of eternity, which is God's resistance. You may say that sounds like a nice catch word, but what does that mean? God resists sin, self, the world, and the devil. If you, if, you, if you know what life is about, you know what it feels like to be chained up. You know what it feels like to be in bondage to things that you do that you wish you, could, you would stop doing. You know what it's like to feel like you have that highest sense of oughtness and yet you can't live it. And you know what that feels like. So God says, resist sin, self, the devil, and the world. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life before? Never, I'm an angel. An angel. Doesn't matter if it's a small lie or whatever. 
But if somebody tells lies, what do you call them? A liar. How many of you have ever stolen anything in your life? Doesn't matter what value it has on it. How many of you have ever stolen? I have. You know what? What do you call somebody who steals? A thief. Jesus said, if you look at a woman to lust after her in your own heart, you've committed adultery with her already. How many of you have looked at someone else to lust after them in your heart? I know I have. Jesus said that you've already committed it. How many of you have been so mad you wanted to beat somebody's face in? Maybe you've done that too. Jesus said if you hate somebody in your heart, you're guilty of murder already. Why? Because the seed of the problem is not inside of my head. The seed of the problem is inside of my heart. I know a guy, he was dating my sister. And he tried to cut my sister's throat with a, with a razor knife. And then they arrested the guy and they tried to put him into anger management classes because they said, you got an anger problem and you need to go to anger management. Do you know what happened? Nothing. That guy's still as angry as he ever was. You want to know why? Because they give you a paper that has a bunch of affirmations on it that say, you're not supposed to be angry when you feel angry. Just take this paper out and read over it. it it's the foolish. It's foolish. It doesn't do anything. You're just telling yourself a lie. That's why Jesus said, in the heart is where all this wickedness is. In the heart is the fountain of sin. Adulteries, murders, thefts, anything that, that is wrong in society first starts in our heart. And that's why Jesus said it's in the heart. So when you have joined God's resistance, you must resist sin. You may say, how do I do that? If you sin, you can either agree with God's verdict if you really want deliverance, you can agree with his verdict and go forward, or you can ignore it and still be stuck in the same place. The thing is, the law of God comes to every single one of our hearts to show us who we are. It doesn't do anything for us. You can try and be a better person, but you're not going to be a better person just based off your own efforts. All the law of God does is says you're guilty. You're guilty. You're undone. You have no hope. You're a sinner. That's all God's law does. But if we want to resist sin, here's what we do. And God knows if we're being real with him. Here's what we do. We say, Lord, I'm done with sin. I'm turning my back on it. That's not going to save you. That's not going to change you. But you're done with it. I don't want to go this way anymore. I've said it this way. It's like I got some boys, young boys. And these young boys, if there was like an excavator outside digging a hole in the front lawn, I would tell them, don't go over there. There's a giant hole. Now, you know, when you tell your kids, don't do this, the very next thing they do is what you just told them not to. So they end up going over to this hole, they fall in, and you hear screaming out there. And I'm looking out the front door, and I'm thinking, what's going on out here? And then I know, uh, they're down over there in the hole. So I go over to the hole, and I say, boys, what happened? And they say, well, I know you told me not to go over here, but, Dad, it was just so awesome. We wanted to check it out, and now we've fallen in here. Will you forgive me? And I say, sure, boys, I forgive you. And then I turn around and walk back inside and shut the door and leave them in the hole. What does that do for them? It does nothing. But they have to have a repentant heart first. They say, I did wrong. God, forgive me. Change me. But you know what? When I reach down in the hole and I pull them up and out of it, now that forgiveness means something to them. Now they got a second chance. And that's what God does for us. He doesn't just forgive us of our sins, but he also cleans out our heart and changes us. And that's what he wants to do for every single one of us. He wants to forgive us, but then he wants to pull us up out of the hole. What's that? I just got to hear this because I want to know if this is really God. Okay. I want to know the word. You know. If it's really the word of God, yep. then I need to hear this. Okay. Here. I want to see if I it's real. He oh, gave you got me one? You got one. one. I'm just okay. listening to you. So, that's what God does. There's, there's such shallow, fluffy teaching in Christianity these days. You find it on the bookshelves, you find it on radio, anywhere. And they tell you that when you give your life to Jesus, you just get your ticket punched. So you got your get out of hell free card. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us to reject sin wholesale. And I can't do that just in my own strength. 
And I remember trying to do that. And the more I, the harder I tried to do it, the more I felt like I was overcome by it. The harder I tried to just grit, you know, and just with all my might go against it, the worse off it got. And the worse I saw in my own heart, the worse I saw, here's the problem. Here's what's going on in my heart. And I was thinking, Lord, what do I do? I can't get out of this mess. And that's what we need to do. We need to get to the place where we're done, where we're absolutely done with sin. And a lot of times you can go to a church and they just tell you, you just pray this little prayer and everything's going to be better. But you and I know the fruits of that. You can find it everywhere. People call themselves a Christian and yet they live the same way they always lived. I'm just telling you, when I got serious with God and I did agree with his verdict, he did change my heart and he made me a, an entirely different person and changed me. I remember thinking after this, all these things that had chained me for so long inside of my own heart was gone. And it was different. And it was because I agreed with God's verdict. There was many other times where people tried to come up to me, even like what we've been doing, when he handed you the tract and all. I remember this guy came up to me, he handed me a tract. It was on premarital sex. I was, I was going to a show in Manhattan. I was going to some uh, concert out there. He hands me this tract. He was a monk. He's dressed in a monk's robe. And I saw him like two weeks ago. And I said, dude, how'd you get here? He said, we walked. I said, you walked? I was like three or four hours away in a car. He said, I walked. I said, you walked? Yes, they happened to be some like monks that I guess walk and talk with people. Whatever that guy was, I don't know. But he gave me that track then. And I thought to myself, whoa, God knows right where I'm at. Because this stuff's been bothering me and been on my conscience. And every time I tried to get away from it, it was like somebody else step in my life. Everybody else comes in my way. Somebody else tails behind me and starts talking with me. And then I get a track here. I get a track there. I get this phone call here. Stuff would happen. This open Bible would be open. And there's this verse right there that jumps out. Whoa. That happened to me for years before I listened. So all I'm asking you to do is to resist sin. Not only in ourselves. But when you can resist the sin in yourself, then you can resist sin outside. Because then you can see clear again. And God wants to do that so bad, especially in this day. And if that wasn't enough, he wants us to resist self. I'm talking about the corrupted self. Jesus said, if you're going to follow after me, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. Then you can be my disciple. Which means that if you don't take up your cross, and follow Christ and deny yourself, you can't be his disciple. It's costly. Jesus said, if you're going to build a tower and you don't count to see if you've got enough money to finish the building project, that man's a fool. Or if you're an army and you're going to war and you don't see if you've got enough military power to win this war and then you just start going at it, he said, you're a fool if you don't count the cost first to see if you can do it. And that's the same thing. We've got to count the cost first. What about self? Will I deny myself, that corrupted self, that corrupted heart? We can make everything look nice on the outside. I can paint a pretty picture. But what about, sometimes people say, I'm a good person, I do good for other people. But if you look down in their heart, the reason why they're doing good is because they want other people to see them and they want other people to think that they're good. And we've already, we've already just ruined it. We're not even doing it for the right reason anymore. That's why he says you've got to resist yourself also. Because that's where the fountain, that's the fountain of sin. It comes from self. So I need to give him all my perceived good. Not only resist the bad, but then I come to him and say, here's what I think I got to offer you, Lord. And I'm going to lay myself down like a living sacrifice before God. And I'm going to burn while I'm alive with the fire of God. I'm not, God doesn't want a bunch of dead people. He wants people that are alive. He wants people that are sold out to him, that can walk after him, be filled with his spirit and scatter light inside of the darkness that's around us right now. And so we've got to resist sin self. And a part of this is we have to resist the devil. You can see crazy stuff around. You can see people acting evil, but the Bible says we don't battle against flesh and blood but spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a, there's a war going on that if we're not following after God, if we don't believe what Jesus said, if we don't believe in the Son of God and we haven't been saved, then we, just by default, are embracing the world system. No, no, no. Give, them, give them the whole truth. 
tell them the bold word it's spiritual warfare yeah it is that's what it is it is it's not just a war tell them it's spiritual warfare it is it's spiritual warfare yes. but the way that it's manifest is all the craziness that you see not only in your own life but in everyone else's life if we just think that it's it's your fault or it's your fault do you know what happens we're already seeing it we're at war with one another we hate one another and now we're just screwing everything up all over again it's not supposed to be like that there is a devil in communist rule this is what they would do Karl Marx he said if we can just get a bunch of useful idiots then we can push our cause to go farther and that's what the devil does he gets people to link themselves with him and they don't even know that they're doing it so they're the useful idiots forwarding the devil's cause and marching on his orders and they don't even realize they're doing it and we can see that happening in society around us and the reason it's happening is because there is a real devil a personal devil the epitome of evil everything evil that you could imagine times infinity and beyond is inside this person and he slips up behind every single willing heart and comes up and just starts whispering starting to try and influence us to go away that you and I know we shouldn't go but he's relentless he just keeps pushing he just keeps speaking he starts laying stuff out in front of us seeing what's gonna catch and then he draws us to himself do you know the Bible says this thing's cutting in and out so much the Bible says that the devil is the God of this world he's the prince of the power of the air so you can see we need to resist sin, self, and the devil, but we need to resist the world because the world is the devil's system. The devil has got a certain measure of control and reign over the world system. What's that? You met the devil? I met the devil. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm telling you. We need to go full on war against the devil. You know what I'm saying? Like, because what are you trying to say? Like, are you are you representing the devil? Because when we out speak, come on, come up here and talk. We need to hear y'all. Come talk. This is this is how we're gonna win this. We're gonna win this when we realize. What, are you winning? what am I saying? What are you winning? What am I winning? What are you winning? What are you winning? We're, Where's your life heading to? Where's your life heading to?